My name is Arisia Lenny, and I'm on the board of directors of the Center for Constitutional Studies. And I should also tell you that as a member of Alberta's uh, Department of Federal and Intergovernmental Affairs at the time, a relatively young member, um, I was an active participant in all of the numerous constitutional negotiations and conferences in the uh, five to six years leading up to this seminal conference, with one very important exception, and you guessed it, the 1981, November 1981 conference. I was on maternity leave at the time, and I guess my timing wasn't great. But given the faltering pace of negotiations until then, I wasn't inclined to base my family planning on what appeared to be the dim prospect of an agreement. And it turned out I was very wrong in my prognosis, and as a result, I never bet on outcomes anymore. What you will have heard last night and this morning is that this extraordinary deal that was struck in November 1981 was not the outcome of a short-term negotiation. It was the culmination of a long journey with many twists and turns on the road. Not only in the years preceding, but indeed in the decades preceding. This morning, we had fascinating discussion, and last night, fascinating discussion. And I believe that the uh, Honorable Judy Arola's comments at the end of the morning have actually provided an excellent bridge to our afternoon. Because this afternoon and evening's program is an opportunity to hear firsthand from some of the key decision makers and negotiators who were there in November 1981. These people were part of the high drama. And as the printed program says, their hard work, dedication and skills ultimately led to the patriation of Canada's constitution, the formulation of its amending formulas, and the entrenchment of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. This afternoon and this evening is an effort to parse the dynamics of those very intense and historic negotiations and to gain a better understanding of what happened and why. We start with the Honorable Roy Romano. During the night, or I guess during the day of November 4th, 1981, after several days of unproductive discussions, Mr. Romano, who was Saskatchewan's Attorney General at the time, together with the Honorable Jean Chrétien, the Minister of Justice, federally, and Ontario's Attorney General, Roy McMurtry, crafted a plan. We are fortunate to have Mr. Romano in our midst today to give us his recollection of events and the role that this plan, popularly known as the Kitchen Accord, played in the negotiations. We then go on to two panels of eminent former senior provincial and federal public servants who were involved very directly in the negotiations. The first panel is comprised of uh, former deputy ministers and senior advisors who were in the room at various times, who heard the discussions, who provided astute advice to the respective first ministers, and who acted as a liaison with drafters as well as between governments. They were a critical link, and I don't think they got any sleep at all that week. They will share their fascinating recollections of that tension-filled time. The final panel of the afternoon features the drafters who can relate how they then shaped the actual constitutional text in their efforts to reflect the discussions. You will already have heard how the, important the role of the legal drafters is in bridging between the conceptual or the ambiguous and the concrete. And I expect that they will have some very interesting stories and recollections. Unfortunately, for various reasons, including personal commitments and simply a lack of time on the program, we could not include everybody who was in on the 1981 negotiations. But we feel nonetheless that you will get a fair representation and gain a fulsome and thorough understanding of the dynamics. There are many stories out there. We've already heard some today. We will hear more this afternoon that have not been told before and undoubtedly, 
there will still be others that remain to be told. Our moderator and chair this afternoon and evening is a person well known to many. The Honorable Jim Edwards has had a multifaceted career. Following 29 years in public and private broadcasting, he served as a progressive conservative member of parliament from Edmonton from 1984 to 93 and was president of the Treasury Board in 1993. Like so many others here today, he was drawn into the irresistible allure of constitutional affairs, co-chairing the 1990-91 Baudouin Edwards Joint Senate, Committee, Joint Senate Commons Committee on the process for amending the Constitution. Please welcome Mr. Edwards. Thanks very much, Arisha. It is a great privilege to uh, introduce the Honorable Roy Romano, who uh, served as Premier of Saskatchewan from 1991 until 2001, and uh, who had a long, long elected uh, career in that province, having first been elected in 1967. He served, uh, of course, uh, from 79 uh, through the uh, Constitutional Accord and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in 1982. And of course, uh, after, as so many of our distinguished premiers have done, after he left uh, the office of premier, he's been serving the country with a royal commission on, on health issues and, uh, and uh, was appointed to the Privy Council of Canada and named to the Security Intelligence Review Committee in late 2003. And since uh, 03, Mr. Romano has been the spokesperson for the Canadian Index of Wellbeing and chair of their advisory board. And I think that it's, it's fitting that someone who survived the constitutional wrangles should now be dealing with well-being. Whether that's remedial or consequential, I can't say. But uh, I, on a personal note, since we've had the tale of John Buchanan's first kiss and we've heard from Arisha about fl family planning, I have to uh, tell a family a secret about uh, Mr. Romano my family, not his, but uh, he doesn't know this story at all, but he, he caused my wife and me, he caused me to miss an airplane in Montreal in um, 1981, just before this round of discussions uh, got underway. Uh, my late wife and I had been in Newfoundland on a holiday, and we were changing planes in Montreal, and there was a fuss, and there were all the TV cameras and so on, and so we asked what all the fuss was about, and they said, Roy Romano is coming. My wife said, I don't want to miss seeing him. So we didn't miss seeing him, but we did miss the plane. <laughs> the Honorable Roy Romano. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Jim, for that very kind introduction. Um, I uh, asked him uh, as I was coming to the microphone whether it was true. Uh, the story about his wife, he says, is absolutely true. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, don't, don't know what quite to say in response, but uh, this is certainly a very distinguished Canadian in his own right. I'll start off that way. I want to uh, begin by uh, thanking him for the introduction and thanking Arisha, who is a very important player uh, for being responsible to staging this, con this conference and uh, thank you for the opportunity of addressing you. I might uh, say at the very beginning uh, that I note the print of the agenda calls for panel one, Honorable Roy Romano, 1981 Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, Government of Canada, <laughs> is what it says. So as uh, Eddie Goldenberg told me on the way in, now everybody knows how it, do how it, was, how it was done. I was on the inside all the time working with Mr. Trudeau and, and Eddie Goldenberg and Barry Strayer. Well, it, it is indeed an honor to be part of this conference exploring the method and substance of Canada's most significant constitutional development since Confederation. And I'm very pleased especially to be present, seeing in the audience being present here, the very distinguished premier, former premier, and one of Canada's really outstanding citizens, the Honorable Peter Lougheed here. Uh, Peter, Premier Lougheed, where is he? This is a person who is truly a great Canadian. I want to say a word about why this conference matters as I see it. Of course, those that are here are here 
because I suspect you believe that what happened in November 1981 does matter and that the search for its dynamics and its values is an important step in national self-awareness. To my mind, it reflects both a point of constitutional maturity and a point of sophisticated intergovernmental process. A nation lives in significant part by its understanding of its constitution's purposes and its principles. And we most certainly do not make a mistake when we take time to get beneath and beyond the Constitution's particularistic and often contingent provisions and look for the true meaning that it has for its own political community and the sense of nation that propelled its makers into agreement. I believe that it, by understanding the context of it and the Constitution and how it was made, that we come to a better understanding of what the Constitution bears on our present context, in the place and time in which and at which we now stand and now gather here. When we honor our past, we enrich our present. So why was this constitutional reform so important? And what did those who participated in the processes by which it was formed believe it to be its value to our national development? Well, first, no one should put ahead in the ranking of importance the value of Canada and patriation, the putting in place of a fully domestic constitution that stood for Canada's fully realized and formalized capacity of self-determination. It is what sovereign nations place the greatest stock in. And since the 1926 Belfair Declaration by Great Britain, full patriation had been Canada's aim and its hope. This project was, in my judgment, interrupted by depression, war, social reconstruction, the demands of the modern activist state, and finally by the great difficulty of finding a national consensus. In all of these years, Canada, I argue, both yearned for this sign of its sovereignty and experienced the near impossibility of obtaining the necessary national agreement to achieve it. At the end, we did not, in fact, find the full national agreement that we wanted. That fact will, for quite some time, I suspect, be an element of some degree of failure in the history of our nation building. A kind of a chink, perhaps a small chink, maybe a larger one, depending upon your point of view. But in my view, we have, notwithstanding this problem, and will have better and understanding of what the nation means. We have and will, be, will, bear better, here, will bear better than would have the endless scenario of divisiveness and conflict overall that confront, confronted us on the afternoon of November 4, 1981. And that would have stood as Canada's deep failure as a nation if we had failed and as its shame. I recognize that this is a highly contentious assessment in some quarters, but I maintain that one cannot understand the dynamics of November 1981 without grasping the strength of the imperative on Canada to find in itself the capacity to set its own destiny. The deals made were certainly imperfect, and the process by which they were made was unfair, but the full realization of our nationhood in the 1981-82 constitutional reforms was an achievement whose national value is, in my judgment, beyond measure. Other important constitutional achievements also attended the November 5 Agreement, an amending formula that enabled constitutional patriation, the constitutionalization of rights, and a commitment to pu fund public services and public government equally. And may I dare to mention the West's own agenda, Premier Lougheed, a priority, a better constitutional regime for the taxation and regulation of provincial natural resources. But there were also failures in that agreement, other than the one that I have already mentioned or alluded to, namely with respect to Quebec. These include the failure to include gender equality that could not be abridged by legislative action, the failure to not to give constitutional recognition to Aboriginal rights, the failure not to reform the Senate or to give explicit constitutional protection to the Supreme Court of Canada. Thank goodness that before too many weeks following November 4 and November 5 of 81, at least some of these gaps 
were addressed and rightly corrected. The point that I really want to make is that in 1981, the nation, through its political leadership, sought to find a way to complete the construction of Canada and to adopt important modern elements of liberal democratic constitutionalism, the recognition of human and minority rights, the instrumentalities for effective public social care, the recognition of indigenous people's rights. This is a heady constitutional agenda and it did equip, in my view, Canada for its future. We are right to meet, to convene, to debate, and above all, to celebrate this great achievement. My part in this conference is to talk about, for a very short while, the role of the so-called Kitchen Accord. Well, the most obvious place to start is to note that it would simply be unbelievable to follow this description of momentous and hard-fought statecraft with the claim or the belief that the new constitution was somehow actually designed quickly in a pantry really, or a kitchen as they called it, on the fourth floor of the conference center within a matter of four or five minutes and its terms were crafted on two sheets of note paper. Let me elaborate on this obvious disjunction in two ways. First, the 1982 constitution did in fact flow from an accord, but it was not the Kitchen Accord, the better name for which, but not the name that history in its whimsy has chosen to give it, would be something like the Kitchen Proposals or Kitchen Proposals. The 1982 Constitution was based on a signed accord, an accord entered into by 10 of Canada's first ministers. It is they, who led the constitutional negotiations. It is they who represented the political communities they led. It is they who in their best judgment decided that the best interests of Canada and its people would be served through their formal agreement to the November 5 constitutional accord. The kitchen proposals were, as Ron Graham has described in his recent book, The Last Act, and as Howard Leeson has described, were, really a stepping stone or a part to the overall fabric which led to that accord that the first ministers arrived at. Now the second point that I want to make about the relationship between the complex process of high politics that produced the Constitution Act 1982 and the short encounter in the kitchen to sketch out terms of a possible compromise is that both aspects, complex statecraft and quick jottings for a possible deal reflect the same basic underlying reality. That reality is that the process for making the 1982 Constitution was the process of extended teamwork. Extended teamwork. Let me say a word about that. Teamwork within governmental delegations, all of them. In my political career, I have been involved in a great many intergovernmental policy processes, but not one of them has generated the same level of political commitment, dedication of resources, and the building of such skilled and talented teams of officials, analysts, and lawyers. I'll only speak of Saskatchewan's team. We're not unique though. Saskatchewan had an excellent team, but so did the other governments, including naturally the federal team, which is going to be represented on this platform in a little while by many of its best and brightest. In Saskatchewan, our team was led with a tremendous effort by Howard Leeson, who was a deputy to me, and brilliant analytical work by Bob Weiss. Some of these names may be familiar to you. On the legal side, we had the wonderfully sophisticated Deputy Attorney General, Dick Goss, and what do I know, but three brilliant constitutionalists, Professor John White, James McPherson, now of the Ontario Court of Appeal, and George Peacock, amongst others. Naming these people, I confess, tells you little. So let me add this. This process over more than three years entailed hundreds of meetings, hundreds if not thousands of documents and drafts. There was no way to meet the demands of the process other than sending officials and lawyers to meetings almost everywhere, often with uncertain mandates and with little time for consultation and briefing. In my experience, my officials and 
every other jurisdiction's officials, that a job was at the very top of the game in terms of commitment, effort, communication, judgment, and advice upon which the first ministers made their decisions. My friends, good public administration depends on integrity and intelligence. And I saw both of these every hour and every day through three years of constitutional negotiations. But the quality in all of this that stands most out to me is the quality of trust. The trust amongst the first ministers, amongst the ministers themselves and the officials. For example, I trusted them in Saskatchewan and I know they trusted Alan Blakeney, my boss, and me to some extent. And with that, trust came confidence and good judgment. And it is this idea of trust that I want to focus on as I describe very briefly the process of intergovernmental relations in this context. As minister in this process and co-chairman uh, with Jean Chrétien, I came to know many of the others, some of whom are in this room. I'm going to miss some people, but I'll throw them out. Dick Johnson, late Dick Johnson from Alberta, Premier Law, you'll remember him. Chrétien, of course, Gardy Gardam, Roy McMurtry, Eddie Goldenberg, uh, Barry Strayer, Horace Carver, Peter Mikasen, Orisha Lenny, and on it goes. As I can say, I stop there and I leave out so many. These discussions engendered, and these relationships engendered confidence in each other's good faith, judgment, sense of humor, integrity. Who knows what comes first, friendship or trust, but both developed and they became both the keel and the rudder of the constitutional reform process, vital to our success. And the premiers too formed this kind of relationship and this bond. Even in the face of party differences, differences in constitutional vision, intellectual style, theorist or pragmatist, and even differences in constitutional sides as the process grew more intense, especially after October of 1980. And there was something else that was interesting. It's called the CCMC, the acronym for the Continuing Committee of Ministers of the Constitution, an important catalyst to eventual success. It should serve as a Canadian model of intergovernmental negotiation, discussion, and deliberation. I am uncertain as to whether or not there were precedents for this kind of mechanism before, but it was very effective in this case. And whether there was or there wasn't is of little consequence, because what really matters is that the vehicle fostered a robust round of discussions, of detailed and thoughtful proposals, and set the stage for the trust upon which everything else was built. I'm told that it was modeled on previous examples or precedents in 68 and 71, but I do submit that the CCMC was a unique institution. There was great continuity, both as to individuals who were involved, the ministers and officials, and the issues. There was a thorough and intense participation by professional civil servants from both orders of government and highly qualified advisors from outside the civil service. After all, our objective was to provide for first ministers a best efforts draft in all these subjects. It was complicated to be sure. Unlike previous rounds, the CCMC worked in the atmosphere of heightened Western alienation centered around resources. And of course, perhaps the most important issue of all, the independence or possible independence of Quebec. The threat of Canada's breakup loomed. These two forces, the West and Quebec alone, meant that all of us were working in uncharted territory. Still, growing feelings of respect, determination to succeed, and a thorough study of the options created a kind of a bond and a will to succeed, a bond and a will to succeed by all of us who were there at the time. And I suspect the same could be said of the first ministers of the day as well. Why does all of this matter? My answer is this. The period of working together seriously and respectfully over a long period on a policy project of such great moment to our nation meant that at a crucial moment, a moment of collapse, despair and failure, a moment in which the Prime Minister, Mr. Trudeau, thought it best that was Wednesday the 4th, 
thought it best to walk away from the talks, call in the press corps, and declare that we had failed as a nation, it was also a moment in which the cooler heads of Peter Lockheed, Alan Blakeney, Jean Chrétien, to name some, recognized that there was still a possible agreement and a compromise. The project was saved not by the substantive brilliance of anyone or anybody's correct understanding of the constitutional needs, and not by miraculously discovering the perfect formula for constitution making, but by relationships that were built on friendship and I repeat again by trust. This fact of good relationships cannot be overstated. It kept the common ground and the common purpose going. And so when this moment of breaking up the conference took place, Kretchen and I met very briefly. We had been meeting several times over each of the days and for several times over the three years and became friends, met hurriedly, not because we had any answers, I want to stress that, or even a great deal of hope, but because our friendship and our mutual sympathy for each other's anxieties and fears simply compelled us to try to continue searching for a constitutional plan that might, just might satisfy the interests of the premiers and the prime minister and all the others involved. We agreed to agree on something. And together with Roy McMurtry's help, we agreed on terms that we thought did not break our trust with each other, did not break our trust with national principles, and most importantly, perhaps, did not break our trust with any of our principles, and I mean here our premiers and our colleagues. As we know, the document was produced, and most of you have seen it in the books, I've got a photocopy of it here, my handwriting. We met quickly, patriation we could agree, Vancouver amending formula, which is really Peter Lougheed's formula, agreed. All the charter except the second, hand, uh, second half, uh, as stated by Hatfield, was gonna be subject to the override, agreed. Newfoundland wanted a slight change on mobility of affirmative action. I remember saying to Kretchen, minority language rights, can we opt in uh, after two years and after a referendum? And he yelled at me, never, so you see the never scratched out on the side. Resources, as is, which is again the great initiative of Premier Lougheed, equalization, as is, and then I scratched a line, and you see Alberta, Saskatchewan, circled Newfoundland, down below 481. Alberta, Saskatchewan, Newfoundland. By that time, all the time, but at that time at the head of it, was people like Peter Mikkelsen on the direction of Premier Lougheed, Newfoundland, which had tabled its proposal or a proposal similar to ours at around the same time in the day, 481, 9.30 p.m., Goldenberg, he's here. Telephone number, I'll state it, Eddie, 232-0137. Kretjen <laughs> said, don't state my phone number. Uh, and then down below, I scratched another line, I said, what about Indian rights, section 34? Kretjen said, we're not ready to do this. Five-year sunset on the, uh, uh, the legislation of a notwithstanding, or a special majority, two-thirds, before a notwithstanding could kick in. That wouldn't work, I said. The premiers had rejected it already, and that was it. And it took about as long as I have described it here to produce. And as it so happened, I met Alan Blakeney outside, and I said, look, it, I think maybe something here. And uh, he said, well, I've been speaking to Peter Lawhey. They're in very close contact. We're very close friends. And the machinery got going. It was in that pause that this took place. I'm going back to my theme of trust that permitted this to happen. As we know, a sense of positive reaction, slight and very partial from all of this, I don't want to overstate it, followed. But it was enough to produce a delay in declaring failure that Wednesday, that the long project of finding a national solution might just be over. The delay was for an evening only, but an evening in which the long investment in respectful relationships between premiers, ministers, the Prime Minister, officials within delegations, and especially amongst the delegations, produced a big dividend to Canada and our unity. Certainly one catalyst for the evening's coalescence were the kitchen proposals, but others, certainly Premier Peckford's for one, they brought ideas, these others did too, and of course conditions to these various evening meetings that took place in room 481. In any event, in due course, the premiers, their ministers, and their officials 
exploring together and working together, had a plan that they felt the prime minister would see the fairness of. In fact, he did. Although, as Ron Graham writes, again, in the last act, this perception was undoubtedly aided by another little factor. This is somewhat contentious, but I believe it to be true, and that is the bargaining on the part of Premier Davis. I'd love to hear what people like Goldenberg and Strayer have to say about this from the federal side, and perhaps Premier Lougheed tonight. But that too, in its way, was a product of a trusting relationship. Davis had been a loyal supporter of the Trudeau plan. I might say it's some source of irritation to, I'll speak only for Saskatchewan. There was a friendship between Davis and Blakeney, but there's an irritation that Davis had so quickly jumped in and had uh, denied uh, the demands of Western Canada. But nonetheless, he was a loyal supporter of the Trudeau plan at some cost to his own relationships within the country, and no doubt within Ontario. His position that late Wednesday night, forcefully delivered to the wavering, reluctant Prime Minister Trudeau, saying that he was pulling out, was owed respect by the Prime Minister, and ultimately, that is exactly what it was given, and played a role too. People sometimes say that constitution making is like sausage making, something you do not want to watch. <laughs> but for my part, maybe it stems from the fact that I love Ukrainian sausage, <laughs> I want to see it. I want to remember it. I want to try to learn about it even now. I want to celebrate it and most of all, I want to honor it and to honor all those fine people who worked together is my theme, in trust with a common hope for their nation, our nation, the premiers, the prime minister, the ministers, the officials, the drafters, the lawyers, the academics, the journalists, even the citizens who came to parliament or who stood on the steps in the legislatures in Edmonton and in Regina on cold November days, the citizens who constantly gave us advice and criticism, and by far the most important, the people in all parts of Canada, all parts of Canada, yes, in Quebec too, who chose to accept the new constitution which was put forward to them by agreement of the prime minister and their premiers and to participate in a nation with the constitutional principles that we are now governed by. And so I honor today's Canada and this conference for this debate and discussion about what it means. But I honor today's Canada where constitutionalism is the central element of our political way of life, the fundamental underpinning of our way of life. And I think that the events of November 1981 helped Canada to find its maturity and they helped shape Canada's political integrity present and going into the future. I thank you very much for listening to me and good luck. What an insight. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Romano. Uh, you may not uh, realize it, but we have two of the other former premiers uh, here, uh, Premier Buchanan of Nova Scotia and Premier, Pe Premier Peckford of Newfoundland oh, as, as well. I didn't see them. And, I, and I'm sorry I didn't point that out uh, in advance. My, my eyes are always on to Peter Lougheed. I worry about him <laughs> the most. <That's> a... <laughs> right. Now, we've got 10 minutes for questions, and I'm sure that there are lots of questions. Uh, would you come to the microphones? And here's one coming here. There's one coming here. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, before the question, uh, Mr. Romano, you will get an invitation to a similar conference in Montreal in mid-April, and we'd be honored if, uh, if you could attend. 2012. Uh, two questions, very short. On the afternoon of November 4th, did at any time you, Mr. Chrétien or Mr. McMurtry, uh, talk about, if you can at all discuss these things, about, uh, about getting in touch with the Quebec delegation in the latter part of the day? So that's the first question. And the second one... Can I just, I can just answer that very quickly? Sorry to inject. Oh, the, the, answer, the answer is yes. Is the microphone on? Yes. Yeah, the answer is yes. But uh, I'll only speak for myself. We felt that our bosses, and from what we knew ourselves, the deal was simply not possible with Quebec. But the worry about how to approach or how we might be able to get them on side or, uh, was not really discussed at length.
Thank you very much. The second one, um, over these years, over 30 years, you could say, well, I'm looking at this issue with a greater or lesser degree of, of certainty about the, the propriety of it, and today, you present a, a coherent, coherent understanding of your vision and the fact that uh, for a matter of a number of principles, you're very confident about, uh, about the quality and propriety of the whole thing. To put a sense of relativity into this, I'd ask you, and I have to ask you directly for, for the purposes, is there any time, and particularly one week, let's say the week of October 23, October 30th, 1995, as we were marching towards the second referendum in Quebec, at any time, and particularly during that week, have you entertained doubts about what happened in early November 1981? Have I? Uh, personally, the answer is yes. Uh, I, I can't, I know this is contentious in some quarters, and others will speak for themselves here. Some, I hope I don't keep on embarrassing you, Eddie. Uh, good friends like Eddie Goldenberg and Barry Strayer, they'll have their own views. But for me, and in, I can't cite others, I will not cite people like Kretchen and others, but for me, this is an ongoing concern. It worried me in 1995 very much. 50,000 votes was the difference. And uh, I saw some of the ads that appeared uh, on Quebec uh, as Bouchard was making his speeches. I spent time with Bouchard on Team Canada trips. Uh, during that period, and we talked about this, actually. Of course, I think, that's why I describe it as a chink. There are some disputes about whether it's a chink or a big gaping hole, whether it needs to be repaired or whether it isn't, doesn't need to be repaired because the Quebec people themselves, notwithstanding their government since that time, are living with what I think is a very progressive, liberal, formal constitutional system, which this wrought rather imperfectly. But personally, I do concern myself about it. I can't speak for the others. Yes, sir. My name is Hugo Cyr from UCAM. So my question would be something along the line. Um, vous avez parlé que l'élément important était celui de la confiance. Trust was a theme that, uh, that went, ran through your, uh, your speech. Now, obviously, if no one contacted uh, René Lévesque or the, the Quebec team, um, a, how do you square that with what you said about the importance of building trust over years in order to maintain a good relationship for afterwards? Mm -hmm. That's A. And B, I wanted to know, um, how come you didn't uh, perceive, or was there a perception that there would be no backlash in Quebec um, if Quebec was not included? If, he was, if René Lévesque was told just the morning, about half an hour before the press conference about the deal? First, on the trust issue, um, this is a very tough question, too. On the trust issue, uh, I'll give you a more formalized answer. The premiers will be meeting tonight and giving you their impressions, and that is, of course, what will hold. But when the idea of a referendum nationally by Mr. Trudeau was advanced and seized upon immediately Wednesday afternoon, there was a small, maybe a major, depending upon your point of view, trust which was broken. The agreement amongst the Gang of Eight, so-called, was that you were free to break from the Gang of Eight, but you'd had to give some advance notice you were going to do so. Now, Mr. Trudeau had been mooting and debating, it's in writings, about a referendum uh, as a democratic way of resolving these kinds of issues, a very solid argument. But the notion of a national referendum. I think Peter Lougheed was one of the ones who spoke, as I recall, in, in the fourth floor most eloquently about this, but not only, was just frightening to us with respect to national unity. This now moves away from the question about the trust being broken by virtue of not being notified to now the implications of what happens. We'll leave the lack of formal communication aside for the moment. And it, the notion that we would be fighting in Edmonton, in Alberta, in, in Saskatchewan, Regina, or you name it, on a very divisive issue of language rights uh, and other matters which were contentious, when out here the big issue, I can't speak for Alberta, but in Saskatchewan, certainly was oil and natural gas and resources, and that kind of a takeaway by the Supreme Court of Canada, we just thought was a prescription for the destruction of the country. I, I, 
I thought that the decision made, this is my own personal view, and I've talked to numbers of, of people that otherwise, I can't speak for Mr. Blakeney, but I was very close to him and to others. I think the trust was broken there. Point number one. Now I'm going to say something which will be a bit contrary to my address. Uh, I worked very closely with the Quebec delegation. I knew it very well. In 1978, the Premier's Conference, Premier Lawheel, you remember, was in Regina. And uh, Premier Layton had assigned a minister to look after each delegation. I was assigned to spend time with Mr. Levesque and Mr. Morin. Uh, and I was always hopeful that if and when we got the referendum out of the way and their bargaining power had been removed by virtue of a no, we don't want to separate, no, we don't want the Sovereignty Association motion passed, that bargaining lever would be gone. Then there would be a realization that they'd have to come to some agreement. And there are, very, there are moments when I was more optimistic and moments when I was less optimistic. Naively so, maybe optimistic, maybe cruelly unfair in being pessimistic. But as it moved on and on and on, the train kept on going down the road toward patriation. My own personal view was we would never get Quebec to sign. Impossible. And this now moves a little bit off trust. I mean, I think they trusted me. Maybe they didn't. I certainly trusted them. You may not believe it, but that's the way I felt. I had a good rapport with them. All of us did. But I'm sure this was the case at the Premier's level. Premier Lahey will talk about it. There comes a point when you just realize the circumstances will not permit of any, of any further negotiation. Now, the issue of notification of the decision, which is the Night of the Long Knives matter, uh, Premier Lahey, to his credit, made a special point in trying to communicate uh, the circumstances and to try to convince Levesque, I think the Thursday morning before the, the, the session, and it d did not work. Uh, not because of Lahey's intervention, it didn't work because Levesque was obviously very damaged and hurt by the, the circumstances. That's a toughie. But you know, maybe I'm rationalizing it, and I don't want to sound cruel, and this won't help me at all, but I'll say that. I just got back from Montreal to Edmonton late last night, <laughs> spending three days there. This was a decision that just had to be made. And the prospect of failure in the face of our own unity, in the face of what the international community would say, was impossible to contemplate. We had to make a hard decision. And when the kitchen came about, at least that little portion, that little portion of it all, we had decided there was just no chance at all in getting Quebec on side. One more question. Brief one, please. I mean, may I make, when I say large, I don't mean hugely brilliant or important, but it's a, it's a very big expanse of blanket which is over, thrown over a lot of people. Um, I, I remember talking about trust. Uh, having a, a dinner, this is not, perhaps a, Howard, should I say this or not, I had a luncheon with Trudeau in 1995 or 96, I think I've shared this story with Goldenberg at the Mount, in Montreal. And as we finished the, just the two of us, I was premier at the time and I just wanted to say hello and he was kind enough to open up the door and we had a wonderful conversation. We we're walking down the steps and I said, tell me, I said, uh, Prime Minister, how come you and Blakeney could never get together? Uh, you were both kind of liberal a small L, as opposed to small C conservatives. And you had certain notions with respect to the role of government and social justice in our society and the like. And uh, you certainly uh, knew your constitutional issues well. How come you couldn't agree? This kind of shakes my whole thesis, but, but I still think it holds on the larger over picture. Trudeau stopped as we were walking down the steps and he said, Roy, because I had concluded that Allen would never agree without the agreement and the support of Peter Lougheed. Pure simple. This is a, not a statement of mistrust of Blakeney or of Peter Lougheed. It was a very hard-headed, realistic assessment of the political situation that existed in Canada at the point. The reality is that Alberta and Saskatchewan are very closely tied together in this context. Now, it didn't mean that I, he trusted us less, maybe he did trust us somewhat less than the others, but we did work, and sorry to be so long-winded, we worked in this atmosphere of trust, and I will conclude by saying, and this is being very partisan, I'm not running for office, everybody would be pleased to know, uh, but 
I don't think you can build this country by a notion that says, what's assigned to Ottawa under 91 is Ottawa's. And what's assigned to provinces under 92 is provinces. You don't bother me, I won't bother you. The so-called concept of open federalism, which we hear talked about these days. The only way to make this country work is like making sausage. It's messy and it's tough, but the railroad, whether it's the railroad, whether it's the CBC, whether it's social policy, whether it's natural resource policy, has got to involve the entanglement of provincial and federal governments based on the values of Canadians and pushed by the body politic to come to an advancement of a sort of social policy. And uh, this was messy, <laughs> that's my point, and will always need to be messy if we want to move the agenda forward, in my view. Excuse me for my long-windedness. Can we have a quick one, please? Yes, and I'll give you a quick answer, I guarantee you, Jim. <laughs> Hard, uh, to hard to believe that a guarantee from a yes. former, but I'm out of politics now, so I can. <laughs> I think one of the most remarkable aspects of the Charter of Rights is uh, Section 1, the Reasonable Limits Clause. I'm just wondering if you could very quickly give us the inside story on how that came forward, and was it inspired directly by the U European Human Rights Code, or? You know, I, I cannot. I think I'm going to leave that to Barry Strayer, to, to, and Barry's got his hand. Will you cover that for me, Barry? Good old Saskatchewan boy. Was in total contact with Quebec through the whole process that day and the day before and that night. And we tried to make contact that night with Quebec as we did with all the provinces after we made our first of three proposals, the third one of which we'll talk about tonight. Uh, and uh, we could not get a good answer from them. Uh, we don't know if Mr. Levesque was communicated with before he met with us at breakfast that morning or anybody else was. But when Mr. Levesque came to the breakfast meeting and I explained what our consensus was and the document was there for him to read, uh, that's, of course, when he got upset and whatever. So there was an effort made through the night to make sure all the only province that really we could not initiate a contact at all was New Brunswick. And that was done the next morning before the proposal was presented to the conference. Let's get this straight before the conference. Quebec was informed no later than at the breakfast meeting, and we did communicate with them through my minister during the night. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it then? <laughs> Thank you very much and good luck. I'm sorry I can't be here for the balance of the deliberations. I have a mother-in-law who's uh, elderly and uh, we're in a bit of a rough patch right now. So I'm coming home tonight to visit uh, with her and my wife. Anyway, good luck to you and you're doing a wonderful job in this meeting. Thank you. Thank you.